Okay, it is 2 p.m. Welcome everyone. Thanks so much for joining us this afternoon. My name is Julia Myers and I will be your host for this webinar and I'm coming to you live from the Brooker Creek Preserve Environmental Education Center. We've got another wonderful webinar this afternoon on evolutionary biology. Um, and this is obviously a complex topic that we cannot fit everything into an hour, but we're going to try to give you the best overview that we can. And this program today is sponsored by our friends group, the Friends of Brooker Creek Preserve. So we wanna give them a big thank you for supporting our programs. And if you'd like to learn more about the Friends or become a member, you can find out about that at thefriendsofbrookercreekpreserve.org. And we've got Brian Magnier back today to present this webinar for us. He is um, a conservation biologist and he uh, also used to volunteer here at Brooker Creek Preserve before he moved to Oregon. So we're happy to have him via Zoom today. So I'm gonna turn it over to you and welcome Brian. Hi, thank you for having me once again. We've got an extra participant here. Hopefully she's not too distracting. This is Margo, one of our cats. Um, so today we're talking about evolutionary biology. That was my major in college. So we're kind of trying to fit four years of my schooling into one hour. So we'll see how, how well I know my subject. Um, hopefully I can uh, kind of convey some of these topics um, effectively and in a way that you guys can all relate to and understand. Um, my goal here is to cover, okay, so we have a lot of topics. My goal here is to cover most of these, at least a little bit, just touch on them. We don't need to understand every single one thoroughly. You know, there's a lot of different stuff here. Um, but I feel like a lot of these words, a lot of the terminology kind of pops up, whether it's in a nature documentary or um, in, you know, newspaper, new articles, magazines, things like that, or even on Facebook, you know, just, you know, these words are used. And so they kind of, some of them stand alone and you can understand, okay, mimicry is one thing and DNA is this thing over here. And, but I, I kind of want to try and bring them all together and just synthesize a lot of information and put it all together um, in a way that hopefully is interesting and everybody can grasp. Um, about, you know, I'll try and keep an eye on the clock and maybe 20 minutes in, I'll try and slow down a little bit and see if anybody has any questions. Um, you know, see if, you know, we can recap the beginning. And then I will either continue or if we have tons of questions, I can just, you know, kind of go on answering questions for a while. Um, but the hope is to make it through most of this list. Um, but it, there's no real end to this. There's always going to be more topics out there to cover. And so um, the hope is maybe in a month or two, um, you know, if people are interested, maybe I can keep going, cover, you know, things that people are interested in and still have questions about um, and keep bringing in new topics and examples. So with that, let's dive right in. And the first thing we really need to do is just define evolution um, as a term in biology. And so kind of a good working definition that we can use, because there are a lot of different little definitions out there, is going to be the change in allele frequency in a population over time. So what that means is basically the change in kind of different versions of genes um, in a group of organisms over time. So alleles are different versions of genes. So the gene for eye color, per se, has alleles that might code for blue, uh, blue eyes, brown eyes, etc. And if these changes are heritable, then they are passed down from generation to generation. Um, so if a change occurs um, in DNA and the organism uh, that has that change reproduces, then that change may get passed on to further generations. And if the change gives the organism some sort of advantage over the rest of its population, then that new genotype may spread. Um, if only part of the population gets this new trait, then that could be the basis for splitting into a new species down the road, because now we've got some organisms with this new change and some that are more similar to their ancestor. Um, so a couple of quick things of what is not evolution, sadly, um, in Pokemon, you know, you talk about evolution, and here we've got Ekans, which is kind of a rattlesnake, evolving into Arbok, which is a cobra. Those are related species, you know, it's not really how evolution works. Um, with Caterpie, Metapod, and Butterfree, that's more of a realistic life cycle, but it's still not evolution. You know, so when you see a caterpillar or a little grub 
um, going through metamorphosis and turning into a full adult insect like a beetle or a butterfly. That's not evolution, you know, in this way with natural selection and the like, you know, that those are adaptations, those life stages are different adaptations that have been selected on by evolution. Um, but an organism isn't evolving within its lifespan, if that makes sense. So we'll just kind of get that out of the way. Organisms don't really evolve within one generation. To have evolution, what we need are multiple generations. And so here we have kind of a hypothetical population of mice or rats. Uh, the ancestor, the great, great, great grandmother rat is this kind of light gray at the top here. And let's say this rat has three offspring um, and there's some variation, you know, they're not perfect clones. There might be mutations. Maybe um, this grandmother rat had um, a darker or lighter mate. And so some of those changes are passed on to her kids here. And so she has three um, little baby rats, uh, kind of a dark gray, light gray, and white ones. Now the white ones, maybe they stand out in the environment. You know, maybe it's not very good or beneficial to be uh, a white color if you want to hide from hawks and rat um, and cats and things like that. And so the white ones get eaten. They get taken out of the population. They don't get to reproduce as much. These dark ones, on the other hand, they're living in the underbrush. Maybe it's humid and dark, uh, living around the ground. And so being darker is an advantage. And so over time, the dark ones actually will breed more and more successfully than the lighter ones. And so what we can see here is over just four or five generations, there's evolution happening. The population initially was 100% light gray. And now the end population is only maybe 40% light gray. If that's even the same shade, it looks like it might even be darker. Um, so the whole population has shifted. There's been directional selection towards being darker. Um, for some reason that is advantageous. So when we talk about evolution, a lot of times people kind of treat it hand in hand with natural selection or people think of them as equal. Um, they're not exactly equal. Natural selection is kind of a subset under evolution. And we'll talk about that right here. So natural selection is the theory that Charles Darwin and Alfred Russell Wallace expounded upon back in the mid 1800s. So natural selection is this process by which organisms better adapted to their environment will survive longer and produce more offspring. So natural selection is kind of the main process that leads to evolution in a population. So evolution is the change. Natural selection is one of the ways, one of the main ways that of how that change occurs. Um, but there are other ways that changes can occur in a population. One of them is called genetic drift. This is just change by chance. You know, there are variations in alleles and genotype frequencies based on random chance, particularly in small populations. And to kind of understand how small populations, as opposed to a theoretical like infinite population, make a big difference, we're going to take a, here a little experiment with M&Ms, especially since Halloween is coming up, fitting that we're going to use some candy. So if you have a thousand M&Ms, they come in a bunch of different colors. I ask you to pick 500 completely at random. Chances are you're still going to end up with all the colors of M&Ms in your new population. You know, we've got 500 to choose from. Chances are you're going to have the blues and browns and reds, all of them. But if you only have 10 M&Ms to start with, and then I ask you to pick five of them, chances are some of the colors are not going to be in your final selection. And so you can see with a small population that little changes, if you just kind of take a subset, you're not always going to get all of the information. Here, you're not getting all the colors of M&Ms. In a population of organisms, you're going to have some genes, some different um, adaptations that might be left out. You know, if you took a subset of people, if you were asked to choose th only, you know, three or four people, you know, you, you can't encapsulate all of the diversity that are in people, you know, so you're going to have a subset of what genes are available in a population. Now, none of these changes would be avail you know, would be possible without mutations. So these are alterations of nucleotide sequences. So a mutation could be completely benign. You know, you could have in your DNA, some bits of DNA aren't really used. And so some, a bit of your DNA could be randomly mutated, could be totally neutral, nobody's gonna notice it. But it could also be deleterious um, or it could be beneficial. Um, and then if a beneficial mutation occurs, and it is heritable, you know, it can be passed on to new generations, then it could lead to new genotypes 
and be selected on by natural selection. So mutation leads to diversity. Natural selection acts on that diversity and leads to adaptations. And then drift kind of is in the background causing some genotypes to spread or go extinct based on random chance. But what are the mutations? How are the mutations even there? So to understand that, we kind of have to look at um, kind of the ingredients to these, you know, these building blocks of life that we're dealing with. And so here we're gonna quickly kind of go through the differences between DNA, genes, and genomes, which I think are also kind of conflated a lot of times, especially in like popular science articles. Um, it's not always clear what the difference is there. So we've got all of these little molecules here, these chemicals, these nitrogenous bases. If any of you have seen Jurassic Park, you know, these are the A, G, T, and C that they talked about in the beginning of Jurassic Park, um, that little cartoon DNA strand taught us about those. And so these different chemicals are kind of linked together in this little spiral, this helix called DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. And so the DNA is in this strand made up of all these different chemicals. And the DNA, basically lots and lots of bits of the DNA together are kind of read as individual genes. So in your cells, um, there's essentially a little a little cell machine that reads the strand of DNA and it's like, okay, G, C, T, G, C, you know, it reads the, the lineup of all of the different um, little nucleotides there. And a certain set of that will be called a gene and that will code for certain proteins. And so when you have a lot of genes all together, they form into these chromosomes and you have lots of chromosomes together packed into the nucleus of your cell and the full range of genes and DNA and chromosomes, all of this stuff together, that's your genome. The genome is kind of the whole thing, the whole recipe book. Uh, whereas each gene is like a different recipe and the bits of DNA are like little ingredients in each recipe. Um, but the genome is kind of the whole book. And so that kind of leads us, you know, I've mentioned another word that sounds like gene and genome is genotype. So a genotype is kind of one uh, form of a gene. So at a certain spot in the DNA, uh, if we're doing eye color again, as an example, um, the genotype um, of that gene could be, you know, a certain code of DNA that codes for blue eyes or brown eyes. And the phenotype is kind of the physical characteristic that we see because of that genotype. So the phenotype would be you having blue eyes. Um, and they can be much more, you know, they can be very complex. So multiple genotypes together could kind of form one phenotype. So phenotype, maybe you're tall, that could be caused by a number of factors, including environmental factors, but it could be caused by a lot of different genotypes in there. Um, and then somewhat confusingly, the picture that I chose to go with this slide is actually one individual frog taken just a few minutes apart. So this frog actually has no different genotypes or phenotypes being expressed here. This is one individual just camouflaging itself, um, be, you know, kind of like a chameleon. And so this frog has a specific genotype for this skin color. Um, and the phenotype looks different in these two cases, but it's still the same um, genes that are all being acted on. There's no different, like it's not changing its DNA to change its color here. Uh, another example of you know, different phenotypes here uh, would be the Florida water snake or the banded water snake, very common snake throughout Florida, not venomous. Um, and they're one of the most variable species that you can find around. And so these guys all have slightly different phenotypes, even though they're the same species, the pattern on them is a bit different. And so they might have, you know, some different genetic factors, different genotypes um, that account for the color differences and the different width of the bands. Um, but there could also be some environmental factors. Maybe their diet plays into it. Um, and so there's a, it's very complex kind of coming up with a final product um, in biology and just you know, kind of pointing to one gene. You know, usually it's a whole slew of genes plus environmental and developmental factors. Now to make the idea of the phenotype, which is kind of you know, the physical characteristics that you see in an organism, you know, the embodiment of all the genes, to make that phenotype um, concept a little bit more complex, we're gonna talk about something called the extended phenotype, which is coined by uh, Richard Dawkins, a uh, great author and biologist. 
And so the extended phenotype kind of talks about a lot of the things that are outside of an organism's body that are still kind of governed by their DNA. And so here we've got the eggs of a little sandpiper, nice and camouflaged in here, nice and speckly. This eggshell, the color, the shape of that egg, that's not governed by the baby inside it. You know, that eggshell is governed by the mom that laid the eggs. And so this eggshell, even though it's no longer within her body, that the speckles, the color, the shape, those are all coded for in the mother's DNA. And so this is kind of like the extended phenotype. The eggs are a phenotype of that mother's DNA. You know, they're not their own. They don't have their own DNA, really. Um, and what's even more is the type of nest, the type of grass that's used, the behavior of building the nest. That behavior is also could be viewed as an extended phenotype because behavior is also controlled, at least in part, by genetics and what's in the DNA. And so you can look at, you know, something, um, a behavior or a structure constructed by, you know, a bird like a nest. And you can kind of think of that as tied to um, this whole evolutionary history that has led up to that extended phenotype. And this, you know, that's just a very breeze through way of talking about this concept. Um, if you want to learn more about that concept, if it's intriguing, uh, Dawkins has an entire book called The Extended Phenotype. I definitely recommend that. Um, you know, got a lot of information. It's a bit complex, but it's, you know, I think you, you can handle it. It's, it's very interesting stuff. So moving on a little bit, I've mentioned, I've just touched upon the word fitness. I've kind of mentioned, you know, with the rat example, some organisms breed more and some die out before they're able to breed. Maybe they, they don't have good camouflage and so they get eaten before they are able to breed. Fitness in an evolutionary bio context, it's not really thinking, it's not really talking about like, you know, your physical fitness, your strength. Fitness here means more like how many offspring are you able to have and how many of them will reproduce in the future. So the fitness is kind of more linked to how long can you live and how many uh, babies can you have per year. And there's a lot of different ways, different strategies that you can have a high fitness. You know, so some organisms uh, will have tons and tons of babies and then they'll just die really quickly. Others will spend a lot of time um, and energy on just a few to try and guarantee that they'll actually survive to adulthood. Um, and it can be tied to strength. You know, these, these uh, little pygmy rattlesnakes here, they're doing a, a courtship dance that involves strength and size and, you know, so being stronger in this context will probably lead to having more offspring. Um, but it's, you know, fitness is not really directly the, the strength of an organism. So you have these life history strategies where some organisms, especially a lot of birds and mammals, they put a lot of energy into just a few offspring, you know, maybe one or two a year, maybe even fewer than that, um, especially if they are feeding those babies and you know, taking care of them and housing them and teaching them things, um, you know, then the strategy of the barred owl or maybe a pronghorn or some sort of a deer could be to have one or two offspring every couple of years, but make sure that like almost every one of them survives to adulthood. The complete opposite is the evil little mosquito larvae. They do not need to be taught by their parents to be evil, they just are the way they are. You know, adult mosquitoes will lay millions and millions of eggs in a little pool and, you know, then the adults will go off and probably die or be eaten by birds before the young here grow up and so they get no help in life. The vast majority, 99% of them all die out before they can breed, but because there's just so many of them, they're so prolific, um, you know, plenty of them will reach maturity and be able to reproduce themselves. Um, so, you know, breezing, we've breezed through a few different kind of terms, a couple different, um, you know, big categories with genetics and things. And we're almost, you know, about 20 minutes in. So I'm going to pause here for just a second, see, you know, if everybody's all good, if we're all caught up, you know, if anybody has a couple of questions or wants me to go back to a slide real quickly, I'd be happy to do that now uh, while we sit on this slide before we start kind of tackling more of these 
little terms here. So this is kind of, you know, one, a poster showing off a whole bunch of different little adaptation categories. And we're going to go through a bunch of them in just a moment. Um, so. Okay. Brian, um, we've got a couple all goods and then one question, and then we can continue on. What is the difference between geno and phenotype? Okay, so using the eye color example was probably a bit bad because the, it's so direct. <laughs> um, you know, the, the eye color is, it's a classic simple example because it's only controlled by a couple of genes. And so it's, you know, it's easy to, to keep track of, you know, if you have certain eye color, then your kids will have the same or you know, similar eye color. Um, so a genotype is, would be the, the DNA at a certain gene. The phenotype is, so the gene then gets coded into proteins and the proteins kind of combine into all of these structures. And the phenotype is that end product. So there could be a gene for um, my hand. There's a lot of different genes that go into making a hand. There's fingers, there's nerves, there's all these different tissues. The phenotype could be having five fingers but that could be controlled by multiple genes. And so there could be different genotypes that could change. Um, you know, maybe there's a genotype for longer fingers or different fingernail length or something like that. And so there's, there's lots and lots of these, pheno of these genotypes, which are kind of like the code that makes all of these proteins, which eventually form the phenotype. So the phenotype is kind of this end product. When you see an organism, um, you can you know what their phenotype is, uh, but you don't necessarily know the genotype behind all those phenotypes without like DNA sequencing and stuff. So they are very kind of similar sort of things, but the, the genotype is kind of um, all of the ingredients in your recipe book. And then the phenotype is kind of like the finished product, you know, at the end. <laughs> Thank you. And just to follow up, on that, and the genes are a code for? Proteins. Perfect. And yeah, then, so, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. No, I was gonna say, so uh, something interesting that I, I always kind of get annoyed about is when you watch a movie like X-Men and they're like, oh, there's, you know, genes code for everything. Who knows there's not a gene for flight? Well, there's, you know, it's not like there's a gene that makes you just hover. The gene makes a protein, the protein makes a structure. And then the structure could be wings. There could be a gene that would, you know, with different, you know, cool gene stuff. You could make a person have some sort of weird wings, but you can't really just have a gene that makes you hover. So uh, next time you watch something like X-Men or some sort of, you know, fantasy sci-fi movie, can't keep track of which mutations and which superpowers are possible with weird genetics and which ones kind of break the laws of physics. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. And then would you mind repeating um, the part about the alleles, please? And then um, you can move on. Thank you. Yeah, so um, the thing with, where did I talk about alleles? Oh, alleles, I passed alleles. Um, so, okay, so the alleles are uh, basically, those are the different uh, options for um, the genes. So here we've got the, the DNA uh, with, you know, and it, combines all the DNA into making these genes. These stretches of DNA can be read as genes and turned into proteins. The alleles are um, basically what that gene says at that ex exact spot. So the genotype could be, or like, you know, made up of a bunch of these different alleles, essentially. So the allele, there's a lot of redundant terminology that mean very, very slightly different things. And so uh, think of the allele kind of as just the option of blue versus brown eyes. The genotype is whatever actual DNA, whatever form of G's, C's, T's, and A's codes for blue eyes. And then the phenotype is the physical construction of the eye itself. There's a lot of redundancy, a lot of little nitpicky sort of um, definitions. You know, I honestly, you definitely don't have to understand all the differences between them but it can be helpful just to kind of know vaguely where all of these different definitions fit in relative to another. So when you're reading um, some sort of article on science and you know new gene therapy stuff coming out, you can kind of think, oh yeah, I've, I've kind of got these categories in my head. I know about what it means you know, to talk about different genes or something like that. Um, and we can definitely come back to it at the end um, if that still is not clear. Um, 
you know, I only, I took a few genetics classes. So I definitely, you know, I should know what alleles and genes are, uh, but it's been a while. So if I am not explaining the alleles perfectly clearly, we can look it up together at the end. Um, and I'm also happy to always look up and do extra research at the end after the talk. And then on Facebook where the talk is posted, um, I will, I can write like a little spiel in the comments there, um, kind of correcting or amending any of the things that I said that were confusing right now. So with that, let's kind of move forward a little bit and let's talk about some of these little different adaptations. Um, because I feel like a lot of these words get thrown out, especially, you know, you're watching planet earth or something, uh, the trials of life, and you hear all of these different words and you see some examples of them. Um, but it can be good to kind of talk about them more, um, you know, see more examples and be able to ask questions about how they relate to one another. So we've got a lot of different adaptations. Adaptations can be physical. So the adaptation of this Anhinga, one adaptation would be a long straight beak that helps it pierce and catch fish. An adaptation could be um, having feathers that get soaking wet that are not waterproof in order to soak in the water and get neutrally buoyant so that you can more easily swim. Uh, the adaptation could also be seen as the behavior of spreading out your wings after your nice long swim so that you dry out. So kind of the word adaptation encompasses a lot of different things. And you could pick apart each different part of an organism and look at you know maybe why you think it adapted a certain way. Uh, and there's a lot of different factors that go into it, into that. Um, you know, so let, let's take the, the beak here, long straight beak, um, you know, for catching fish. Why wouldn't it be longer and straight? Like, why wouldn't it be even longer? You know, why did it stop at this exact sort of length here? Uh, is that the optimum length for catching fish? Or maybe there's some other factor kind of involved as well. Like maybe if it gets too big, it might be better at catching fish, but it would be too heavy. And so it would be a strain on the bird's neck. And so there's a balancing act between a lot of adaptations here. Um, but in general, adaptation is kind of just this very broad blanket term uh, for things, characteristics, behaviors that are acted upon by natural selection and have been honed to, um, you know, kind of this, this function, um, you know, why the organism is, is the way it is. So one of the most common adaptations to talk about is camouflage, uh, looking like your surroundings so that predators can't find you. Um, now camouflage here, this, you know, this isn't a conscious choice. The grasshopper did not think, oh, I'm going to go, you know, hang out on some white sand. So I'm going to be this kind of white color. This is kind of an innate sort of thing. These grasshoppers for generations, for literally hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years, they've been living and breeding on this white sand. And so the grasshoppers that match that background the best are the ones that survive um, and reproduce the most. Um, a darker grasshopper, either it's going to get eaten or it'll have to have some sort of behavioral trait that kind of tells it um, to hang out on a darker background. You know, so you can have um, the same species have slightly different color morphs as good camouflage, um, but as long as those traits are reflected in where the animal actually hangs out. You know, if this grasshopper didn't have the right behavioral sort of um, genes going on, the right uh, things turned on uh, in their brain, uh, in their nervous system when they were, when it was young, maybe it would accidentally be hanging out on dark soil, it would quickly be eaten. And those bad genes telling it to not hang out in the right place, those genes would be eaten and taken out of the population. Now the opposite of Camouflage is aposematism, these aposmatic colorations. And so the one of the classic examples is the poison dart frog, the poison arrow frog from Central and South America. Um, these guys are super brightly colored. They're obviously not trying to hide from anybody. You know, you can spot this strawberry poison dart frog on this green leaf from a mile away. Um, and the, the idea here is that these guys have toxins in their skin. And so they have evolved to be brightly colored specifically so that predators can recognize them. The predator, maybe a bird, sees a frog and a bright red and blue frog that's so obvious on the ground. This bird, over time, whether it's 
within the bird's lifetime behaviorally, or whether it's over a very long period of thousands or millions of years of you know, learning genetically, innately, um, the bird learns not to mess with frogs that look this brightly colored. And so even if this frog didn't have the toxins in its body, it would probably be protected from predators just because they don't want to take the risk. And that's why you have some species kind of evolving mimicry. So we have here one of the other classic examples of um, aposematic coloration is bright orange and black coloration on the monarch here. Uh, they are toxic, you know, they, their caterpillars are eat milkweed. Um, they gain those toxins into their body and so they're distasteful to birds and other predators. And other butterflies like the viceroy, like queens and soldiers, they aren't toxic. They don't have to, you know, have their uh, caterpillars feeding on milkweed. They're, they can feed on other things. They can take advantage of other food sources, but they can still take advantage of the predator's aversion to this color by trying to look like a monarch butterfly. And we've got two different types of mimicry uh, that are often talked about. We've got Batesian um, and Malarian, named after some old, you know, old evolutionary biologists from centuries past. And the idea here is Batesian mimicry um, is what we see here. We've got a non-toxic um, mimic of an actually toxic host. And so the Viceroy is a Batesian mimic of the monarch. It is non-toxic. It's taking advantage of the toxic nature of monarchs. Malarian mimicry, on the other hand, has to do with looking similar and still being able to back up that being toxic, um, you know, the thing that you're selling. So wasps and bees, we've got tons of wasps and bees out there that are all yellows and reds and blacks, and they all look, they all, a lot of them look very similar. A lot of them, if they can still sting, those are malarian mimics, because um, let's say a bird learns to avoid this big scary wasp in the middle, middle here, big giant scary executioner wasp or something like that. The bird learns to avoid them because they've got a big powerful sting, and so they try to avoid pretty much all of the other insects that are black and yellow and look similar to this wasp. And other insects could also sting. They don't need to, you know, just be a fake like the Viceroy. These would be malarian mimics because it helps reinforce the idea that yellow on black means scary. Um, and so the more malarian mimics you have, the more yellow and black wasps that are actually stingy you have, the more likely it is that predators aren't going to feed on you because, you know, bigger percentage of the chances um, lead to getting stung in your mouth. You don't want that. Uh, but there is at least one hiding Batesian mimic on this slide here. I don't know if you spotted it. This guy over here near the top right, that's a fly. That's not a wasp. This guy is trying to mimic the stingy wasps. So this fly here is a Batesian mimic, whereas some of these other wasps and bees that actually do sting would be malarian mimics. Uh, and because there are so many bees and because animals really don't like getting stung in the mouth, there are a lot of different insects that mimic the yellow and black pattern. Here's an even cooler fly. This one I saw at Brooker Creek a couple of years ago. This hoverfly is just gorgeous black and yellow and it's perfectly mimicking some sort of like a yellow jacket, but it's a, it's a fly. It's got no sting. It has no punch to it at all. It is a Batesian mimic. And the line between mimicry and camouflage can kind of blur, especially when you start mimicking a plant. Um, so here, a katydid and a leafhopper, they're mimicking things like leaves and thorns in their environment. And so here we call these mim you know, plant mimics or leaf mimics uh, but the idea is, is pretty much identical to camouflage. There's no defined, there's no real line between the two. I guess here, if you're mimicking something that's a totally different food source, maybe that just kind of becomes camouflage at that point. You know, so here, another leaf mimic Katie did. This one's even got a fake bite already taken out of its leaf. This leaf looks distasteful, even if you like to eat leaves. Um, so that's like doubly good camouflage. Um, you know, more leaf hoppers, you know, kind of looking like little thorns on a stem. Nobody wants to eat the thorns. And so 
it's a good way to just hang out and be left alone if you look like, you know, a little thorn on a stem. Another form of mimicry is something called auto mimicry, where you kind of are mimicking part of your own body. Um, let's say you're a bird, you know, a little songbird flying high up in the sky, you're looking for bugs to eat, and you spot this butterfly, this hair streak here on the left, you spot it, but you're high up, you're moving, there's foliage around. It's tough to get a clear look at it. And from above, you can see the kind of the hind wings here at the top, they're flared out, they're colorful. They've got these little bits that stick off that look like legs or antennae. And so it's kind of tough to know which end is up, which is the head and which is the tail. And if you're a bird, you want to catch the head of the insect because you want to kill it quickly. You want to incapacitate it. If you just catch the little wingtips, you're going to get a little bite of some wings. There's not many calories in there. And the butterfly is going to be a little bit injured, but it'll fly away. Its head, its organs are all intact. So the butterfly here is, it's got this auto mimicry of its own head. It wiggles its little butt here and draws attention away from its vital organs. And so we call that an auto mimic. Um, similar things are eye spots uh, to mimic, you know, either eyes or a head, just to draw a predator's attention away from the more vital organs of the body. Um, another really cool thing that is kind of mentioned a lot is convergence. So convergent evolution happens when you have unrelated species that don't necessarily look alike or their ancestors don't look alike, but there's different pressures that are kind of pushing them uh, over evolutionary time. They're pushing these organisms to have similar features because of um, you know, similar pressures, similar uses and functions. So leglessness and limblessness, uh, limb reduction, these have evolved dozens of times. Of course, we've got snakes, but snakes evolved originally from other reptiles that did have legs. Um, but now snakes all, are all limbless. Um, this guy over here in the top right though, that one's not a snake, even though it has no limbs. That one's a legless lizard or a glass lizard. Um, and so that one, it's, they're both reptiles. Snakes and legless lizards are both reptiles, but their common ancestor would have had legs. So leglessness here has been, it's kind of converged upon. It's a convergent trait because there's an advantage to being legless if you want to burrow underground or swim through the water, swim through loose soil, um, you know, under leaf litter, things like that. It can be helpful to move quickly and to duck into holes in the ground if you have shorter limbs that are blocking you uh, from getting around. Skinks are you know, something they're very elongated lizards. They've still got legs, they still use legs, but some of them, if, if you see them running through loose sand, they almost swim through the sand instead of running. Uh, and then of course, things like eels and um, sirens and amphiumas, you know, there's different amphibians and fishes that have evolved leglessness. They look kind of eel-like. Um, there's many different types of eels in the fish sort of realm that have evolved independently because this is a, uh, an interesting, it's a, it's a useful trait if you have um, a need to escape into a hole in the ground. But how about this? This guy's got some limb reduction going on. Is this the same you know, thing happening? Is this the same process that makes a dachshund more limb reduced uh, then a wolf, you know, it's their relatives or, or their ancestors have been things like wolves, things that look more like coyotes. And this, it, you could actually argue that this is an example of evolutionary limb reduction, but it's not because of natural selection, but artificial selection. This is because of people, you know, just in the last few centuries, hunters want to be able to send a dog down a burrow and, you know, be able to grab a rabbit or a badger or something. And so, they would breed dogs with shorter and shorter limbs, with strong jaws, you know, these strong necks. And this is limb reduction in artificial selection over just a few centuries uh, because these dogs were designed by, uh, to burrow and to be able to follow prey down holes, at, you know, for hunting. Something that goes along, along the same lines as convergence is homology. You know, you may have heard of things that are homologous um, as being similar, you know, kind of having similar backgrounds. And so homology in a biological context has to do with having the same ancestral trait 
basically this shared derived trait. So in uh, vertebrates, here we've got a few mammals and a bird. We've got humans, dogs, birds, whales, and we've got these shared traits, this limb bone. We've got, uh, which one is that? The ulna. We've got the ulna in red here. And you can look um, back in time. If you were to look at like kind of a sped up view of humans, dogs, birds, and whales through time going back 100 million years, event, you, know, you could keep track of this bone in every one of their ancestors. And every one of their ancestors had the genes that code for this bone. And over time, you know, they would eventually have a common ancestor that would be like a little, you know, mouse-like sort of mammal that has this same bone. But now it's evolved into all these different forms. Um, but it's, you know, it's still on an evolutionary sort of scale, it's still that same bone. These bones are what we call homologous. So in a human, we've got, you know, the radius and ulna here. And in a dog, they're lengthened a bit, maybe, you know, for better running. In a bird, they're lighter, they're more hollow now, but they're still in the same position, um, but they've been, you know, adapt, you know, they've been um, selected upon to be lighter because birds want to be able to fly. And then in whales, they've lost their big long arms. Whales have kind of shrunk their arms down, and now the arm bones are essentially convergent with their hand bones here. And so this red bone is still homologous with our limb bone, but it's kind of functioning more like a paddle than a limb at this point. So here's where the fun begins with homology versus analogy. So homologous traits are because of shared derived characteristics. Um, you know, we've got limbs and um, hands, dogs have limbs and paws, you know, they're homologous features. Here we've got wings of birds, bats, and insects. Are they homologous? Are they the same? You know, they're, they're all wings, they all fly. Are the wings of birds homologous with the wings of butterflies and moths, let's say? Well, uh, butterflies and moths, they've got a totally different evolutionary background. The common ancestor of insects and birds is well over uh, 500 million years ago, possibly a billion years ago at this point. Didn't have any limbs, didn't have any wings. These are not homologous wings. The butterfly and you know the insects, they've got six legs that are limbs, and then the wings are coming out of their back. So they're completely different developmental characteristic than the wings of birds, which are you know kind of their whole arm has turned into a wing. So they're not homologous traits, these are analogous traits. How about though the, the bird and the bat? I just mentioned on this last slide here, that bird, that forearm bone is homologous with some mammal bones. So obviously the forearms, the limb bones of birds are homologous with some of the limb bones of the bats. But as a wing, the wing as a feature to fly, they're not homologous because the bat made its wing with skin between its fingers. Whereas the bird, as you can see here, has gotten rid of its fingers. All of its little finger bones have fused into these light straight bones here. And so think, here's the weird thing. The wings of birds and the wings of bats are homologous as limbs, but not as wings because their common ancestor did not share wings as that trait right there. And that's, that's a really confusing one. We can talk about more examples to clear that up if you guys want. At this point, it's getting a bit later. You know, it's 11.44 for me, two, whatever that is, 2.44 for you guys. So um, we can see if everybody's good. If everybody has, you know, no questions, we can keep trucking forward. I've got a lot more slides, a lot more stuff to cover, but we could cover that in a future uh, talk together if you guys want, or I could keep going forward uh, Julia, how many, how many do we have questions out there or do we, people want to spend another five or 10 minutes going through slides? We do have a couple questions and go ahead and put into the chat if you would like to keep going. Um, for now, can you clarify um, a posematic coloring versus regular mimicry, please? Sure. So um, a posematic coloring is kind of, it's the bright colors. 
It's, it's just the trait of this poison dart frog. Standalone, nobody's mimicking it. The poison dart frog is really brightly colored and it's toxic and predators, potential predators have learned over generations not to mess with these colors. So um, bright colors are often, they're referred to as aposmatic colors. Um, you know, when there's a reason that they're bright, they're standing out and they're not being eaten. It's kind of the opposite of camouflage. Mimicry, you can have mimics of aposmatic creatures. So the aposmatic coloration, that's the coloration. That's that one frog with the bright colors. Um, you know, the, the wasp, uh, a bright yellow and green and black wasp that might have aposmatic coloration to warn birds, hey, don't accidentally eat me. I'm not like all those other bugs. I'm, I've got this stinger, you know, and your ancestors have tried to eat bright uh, yellow and black things in the past and they've gotten stung. And so over, you know, your genes are telling you don't mess with bright colors. There's a reason they're standing out. They're not an easy meal. That's the aposmatic coloration. The mimics are the ones taking advantage of the fact that um, predators are avoiding the aposmatic coloration. So it's kind of, again, there's a lot of things that are very similar, you know, tied together concepts, um, but hopefully, hopefully that one, you can, you can see the difference between the aposmatic coloration is this adaptation to being brightly colored as a warning symbol, and then other things can mimic that they can evolve to mimic that, um, to take advantage of that. Thank you. And everyone is saying, keep going. <laughs> okay, cool. So we can maybe do another 10, 15 more minutes if that's good for you. Sure. Yeah, there's, there's no shortage of fun examples out there. Um, at least to me, they're fun. Um, so let's talk we, a bit about sexual selection. We've got a few slides on this because it's kind of a broad topic. Um, when we think of natural selection, kind of, you know, that's a pretty broad topic. You know, what organisms are able to survive and reproduce? You know, some die off, some don't get to breed. Sexual selection is, again, a subset within that where the males and females of a single species are kind of choosing who to mate with. And so you can get um, different features on different individuals within a population. Um, because of selective breeding, essentially. And so one of the classic examples, you know, birds, um, they're, they're kind of a classic sexual selection example because they're so visible. Everybody's seen birds with different colors. People know cardinals, you know, bright red males, camouflage, brown females. Uh, here we've got a couple of ducks, these pintail females, camouflage brown. There's no need for the female to be very flashy. She wants to be able to sit on her nest, on, you know, and not be observed by predators. So there's selection on the females to keep them nicely camouflaged, brown, earth tones, things like that. Now, if it was just about survival, the males would probably follow suit. They would wanna be camouflaged too. They don't want predators on their tail. But if they want to show off to the females and say, hey, I'm, you know, I've got these bright colors. Um, I'm able to survive from predators with these bright colors. That shows that I'm strong, I'm fast. You know, predators can see me and I'm still not eaten. Um, I've got enough food to support these ornate plumes, these bright colors. You know, you need to be able to um, feed more if you are a brightly, elaborately ornate creature because you, know, you need more energy to uh, support those, uh, those extra weird growths. Let, let's say you're a moose with, you know, antlers that weigh 50 pounds, you, you're going to need to eat a lot of food to support that weight. You're going to need to be big and strong. And so the, there's selection on the males in this case um, to be brightly colored. And the more brightly colored and interestingly patterned they are um, up to a certain point, the females will select the best patterned ones because they, that, that plumage is kind of a symbol for how healthy they are and how strong their offspring will be. And at a certain point, that kind of breaks free of any actual natural selection. And can you can say, I'm going to have the brightly colored male because it's going to have the brightly colored offspring, which will breed because they're brightly colored. There might not even be a reason anymore 
to be brightly colored other than the fact that the behavior of the population is to breed with the brightly colored individuals. And so you can get this runaway selection that doesn't even care about you know, survival in it, anything anymore. It's just like, oh, the trend is the females will mate with more bright red babies. And so the cardinal needs to get as bright red as humanly possible or as cardinally possible to uh, make sure that their offspring uh, will also be bright red so that they can breed. Another way to show off your fitness, your strength, you know, your physical fitness would be to be big and loud and strong. And with frogs, one of the ways that they do that is the males will call. They will, you know, be in a pond, uh, maybe in the spring or summer, there's a nice warm rain. The frogs come out of the pond and they all start calling. And the loudest ones are the ones that are most likely going to get to breed the most. Um, because being loud means you're big and strong and your voice is going to reach more potential mates out there in the swamp. And so you want to be big and loud, but only up to a certain point. If you become too big, let's say you're a frog that's twice as big as all of your fellow frogs, then you're a pretty big target for predators. You know, you don't want to necessarily stand out in the crowd. And so there's this stabilizing selection a little bit that keeps uh, some adaptations from going run away too far in one direction. Um, when you remove predators from a situation, uh, let's say you're on an island and there's not as many predators, that's when uh, sexual selection can really go crazy. So the, another classic example there would be birds of paradise in New Guinea. Um, there's relatively few uh, predators in the trees um, up in New Guinea. And so, you know, there's tons of food, it's tropical. There, you know, it doesn't really, you don't need to waste your time and energy trying to find food. And so the males of birds of paradise, they spend all of their energy on ornate colorful plumes and on elaborate dances and songs. But it doesn't just have to be a male versus female sort of dichotomy here. You can have selection um, and displays and courtship um, that happen both ways. You know, there are definitely cases where the males and females have to choose each other, especially when there's a longer term bond here. If they're gonna parent together, then it makes more sense that they both want to choose the right partner. Um, so, you know, things like egrets here doing their little courtship displays, um, they're going to nest together. They're gonna to help build a nest, uh, find food for young for a whole year. And for many birds, you know, they'll come back to the same um, partners every year. And so they need to choose each other. It's not just a one on, you know, one female choosing a male sort of deal. Um, there's actually a really interesting uh, case in birds where they have the reverse, where the females are the brightly colored ones and the males um, mate with one female and then the male raises the nest and then the female goes and mates with other males. And it's kind of the reverse of the standard, um, you know, one male gets lots of females approach. It's the opposite. Um, but the reason why it's always that way. The reason why, oh, it's always, you know, the males that are trying to show off and be big and strong and, you know, they get to mate with lots of females is, you know, there's a biological reason. It's not, you know, just this sexist, oh, the males get to be brightly colored and the females have to, you know, stay at home on the nest. There's a biological thing that's happening where the male, for the males, um, they can breed a lot more than the females can. Sperm is very cheap. Um, one male can have you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of uh, partners and babies in a year, whereas females, they've got these egg cells, they take more energy, they take more time. Um, they need to be more picky than the males. Just by pure, you know, natural selection and statistics, the females need to be pickier than the males because they are kind of putting in, putting more eggs in their basket right there with, you know, when they breed with a male, they want it to be the best one possible. And that's why you get a lot of these different species where the males are you know, competing with each other for resources, for space, so that they can have access to as many females as possible. Um, you know, here we've got the bighorn sheep, butting heads um, to kind of assert dominance here. Um, you could have adaptations for bigger horns. Maybe that would make you a better fighter, but maybe they'd be too heavy. And in the off season when you're not rutting and uh, you know, kind of courting females, maybe the bigger horns make you slower and they hurt your neck a bunch. And so there's, again, that stabilizing selection happening on these uh, different adaptations. Or maybe 
the horns don't have, you know, genes that say, maybe there's not, you know, big horn genes as much as there are long life genes and the horns just keep getting bigger and bigger the longer they live. And so in that case, the animals would be like adapted as well as possible just to survive. And the older individuals would be the ones getting the females because the horns get bigger and bigger as they get older. Those are sorts of things where, heck, you could do probably do a master's or a PhD just looking at the genetics of bighorn sheep horns and figuring out is it age or is it, you know, gene determined horn size or something. Um, you know, it's an interesting project idea right there. Um, Okay, we'll do one more example of sexual selection here, and then we'll probably stop. We're getting to the end here. Um, you know, I've got a few examples here, of course, from Oregon. I know we're outside of Florida, um, but now that I live in Oregon, there's a few cool examples that I just can't pass up. The sage grouse um, here are one of the coolest, weirdest uh, examples of sexual selection around. You've got these huge groups of male sage grouse called uh, that they they group together in what are called leks, uh, these sites that are like for dancing. And the males have these big spiky tails and they're just weird. They've got these weird little feathers sticking out of the back of their head and they blow up their chest and they make this weird little boom sort of dance and sound. And it calls in these females and all the females come in and they check out the males and whichever males being the loudest with the best dance, you know, the best, maybe the most symmetrical tail plumes. Um, I'm not a female sage grouse. I'm not sure exactly what they're picking based on here. Um, but either way, all of these males are lecking and the females are coming in to choose which males are the best. And it's just a really cool, weird example of some sexual selection here. Um, so I guess with that, I'd say we should probably stop. I've got a lot more that we could go through. We've got chemical, you know, pheromones, we've got territoriality. Um, but I'd say that's probably a good stopping point for now. And I'd love to take any questions, go back to any slides. And then, um, yeah, maybe in the future, we can talk more about this, um, you know, new topics or go back to any that people liked or were confused about. Um, yeah, it, you know, it's definitely a little bit less flowy, um, you know, less narrative than some of my talks in the past, but it's something that I'm really interested in and passionate about, and hopefully uh, I can get some of you guys interested in at least some of these topics too. Wonderful, thank you so much, Brian. And if anyone has any questions, now is the time to put them in the Q&A box. Our first one here is, uh, can you please review exactly what the Malarian mimicry is? Sure, so the Malarian mimicry, here you go. go back real quick. Um, so the Malarian mimicry is essentially having the same patterns because um, let's, okay, let's, let's do a counter example. Um, let's say you're a wasp with a stinger and you're black and yellow. Um, you know, birds have learned over generations not to mess with black and yellow insects because they might sting you. Now let's say you're a different wasp and you are bright purple. You're also brightly colored. Um, you know, maybe that you could see that as a postmatic coloration in its own, but you're not mimicking, you're not the same color as the normal black and yellow wasp. So birds in your area might not know not to eat a purple wasp. So even though you've got bright colors, if it's not something that is common in the area, the predators might not be conditioned to avoid it. And so there's an advantage to looking similar if you have similar toxins and things like that because the predators have learned to avoid you. So let's say honeybees um, are kind of this orange and black and or brown sort of color. They look similar enough to wasps that you know, you know, when you're out in the wild, you're looking at flowers, you know what bees are and wasps are. Usually you can, you can identify which ones you want to avoid touching. And if they all had bright colors, but they all look different, it'd be really difficult to learn which ones to avoid and which ones to not avoid, which ones to eat, um, you know, if you're a bird looking for food. And so there's an advantage to the wasp to be black and yellow because, you know, even if it's not related to other black and yellow wasps, maybe those colors evolved independently. That would be an example of convergent evolution towards being black and yellow 
because the predators in your area are conditioned to avoid black and yellow things. And so it's, it's kind of mimicking each other in the same way. You know, if it's malarian mimicry, I guess technically you wouldn't really have a host and a mimic of the host. They're kind of mimicking each other because both of them being stingy and black and yellow in the same environment um, kind of really drives home the point to all the birds not to eat any black and yellow things, if that makes sense. It did, thank you very much. Let's see, do we have any more questions? I'm just checking all the, the areas. And I am not seeing any more right now. Okay. That was a fascinating presentation, Brian. Thank you for, for putting that together and walking us through the beginnings of that. Yeah, thank you guys for definitely you know, joining me. I know it's, it's not necessarily the standard thing, you know, where we'd look at one, you know, type of organism, just snakes or birds or something like that. Um, but I feel like it can be useful in understanding other lectures and, you know, things like that. If you, if you kind of just have a sense of all of these different terms and how they fit in together, you know, have a few examples of each one, things like that. Um, and it's always, it's just fun looking at a whole bunch of different organisms and kind of talking about why they are the way they are, you know. Um, and once you know enough of them and enough examples and terms and things like that, you can go out on a hike and you can see critters and plants that you've never seen before, but you can make guesses. You can make hypotheses. Oh, I bet this is, you know, I bet this is toxic because it's brightly colored. You may not know it at all. Let's say you go to a whole new country and you're in the jungle and you see something that looks like a leaf. Maybe you'll think, oh, that's probably edible, but it's hiding, you know, it's camouflaged. Um, but, you know, maybe you see a brightly colored frog and you know not to touch it even though you don't know exactly what species it is because you know these, these general rules and patterns in biology. And so once you start learning all of these things, it gets really fun to go just for a walk in the woods because you start noticing all these extra little adaptations that you maybe didn't notice before. Oh, these bugs are grouped together in this way, you know, because they're, you know, doing some weird courtship thing or something like that. I don't know. I like it. Hopefully some of you guys too, do too. <laughs> It is very fun to look for some of these examples and the auto mimicry. I was thinking of the, the back to front mimicry with the hair streak butterflies. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much everyone for joining us. And Brian, we do have a lot of thank yous um, and hoping there'll be more like this. And we will be recording this webinar and posting it to our YouTube channel. And if anyone has any more questions, you have our emails and have a great rest of your afternoon. Thanks for joining us. And thank you so much, Brian. Yeah, thank you for having me. <laughs> Have a great day, everyone.